So hello everybody, uh, my name is Jane. I'm a final year PhD student at the ANU and today uh, I'll be talking about the temporal evolution of elements in glass. Things a little bit mix up in the titles, but anyways. So going back to sort of the big picture that Sven presented, so the trinity in galactic archaeology we have uh, chemical composition, stellar ages, and stellar dynamics. And for my talk today I'll be mainly focusing on the chemical composition and the age aspects. So why do we care about chemistry? Well, the elements we observe today are mainly produced in different nuclear synthetic sites with different production timescales. So for instance, um, alpha elements like oxygen, magnesium, silicon, they're produced in the core collapse type two supernovae. Whereas iron peak elements like chromium, manganese, and cobalt, they are found usually in type 1a supernovae. And similarly, um, S process elements are usually found in low mass stars whereas our process elements are found perhaps in neutron star mergers. This bit is still a bit controversial. But anyway, so if we combine age with chemistry, we sort of get a really good idea of how the mercury has been chemically enriched. And right now, sort of it's a perfect time to look into this because we're sort of really getting into the era of very large scale surveys. With all these surveys produce uh, more than 10 to the five stars. And for these stars, we're able to get pretty precise stellar parameters and abundances thanks to, you know, the data analysis and people like Sven and Sarah. Um, from these, we can also combine them with these um, revolutionary Gaia parallaxes and kinematics. And together, we can start probing chemical evolution at different metallicities and different galactic locations. This is on, at a much larger scale than we were able to do just a few years ago, so it's all very exciting. So for my talk today, I'll be just give a very brief overview looking at chemical evolution on the galactic scale. Um, I'll be looking at three main things. So the age abundance relationships, the high and low alpha sequence, and also a little bit into about modeling. Uh, so how do I derive star ages? Um, I use method called isochron fitting. So essentially isochrons are these models of equal time on the HR diagram. So on this plot here, um, each of these lines represents a one star at a given age. And this method is best for turn off some giants. So that's the area of circle here. And you just can see that uh, these isochrons are nicely spaced out. So we have fairly high stellar parameter to age sensitivity. And I can, I can get down to about 10 to 20 age uh, uncertainty here. But if we move to the red giant branch and the main sequence, you know, the isochrons are kind of bunched together and the ages there are a bit tricky. So um, let's firstly look at the abundance of age trends. So this plot here is sort of the state of the art differential analysis um, of abund abundance with age trends just a few years ago. It's very high precision and has quite a few elements. So on the x-axis we have age and on the y-axis we have the abundance of the element relative to iron. Uh, so a lot of these papers, uh, one kind of drawback is that they are kind of restricted to a very, just a handful of very solar-like stars. And because of that, they were able to sort of produce these very high precision results. But it kind of begs the question of, do we actually observe the similar trends at larger samples at different metallicities and at different galactic locations? And this is what I think is a perfect testing ground for the substantial galar subgiant sample. So here is the galar abundance age trends for 16 elements. And we have at least 20 solid measurements per element here. Uh, even though we don't have the precision that we have with differential analysis of solar twins. Uh, we hope that our large sample can still tell a very interesting story. Uh, don't I really have time to go into all of these elements, so I'll just briefly talk about the group alpha elements. So reminder that the alpha elements are mainly formed in core collapse supernovae. So here the y-axis is just the abundance of the elements relative to iron, which is metallicity, which is produced by type 1a supernovae. So if we actually look at the ratio between these ty two types of um, elements, we can actually get an idea of how these two types of supernovae interplay in the galaxy. So in the early universe, we see that uh, here we have relative high alpha abundance relative to iron, uh, which just means that there's a lot more type 2 supernovae going on. But then as we move to, full, to the more recent galaxy, 
uh, we see that the ratio actually goes down slowly over time. This is because there's sort of the onset of type 1a supernovae. Um, on the other hand, we can even break down uh, two different types of elements within alpha. So the first one is called the hydrostatic alpha elements. So they are oxygen and magnesium. And these two elements are more of a pure alpha elements because most of them are produced in type 2 supernovae. So here, if we look at the recent galaxy, we see there's a dramatic decrease over time and that's indication of the type 1a supernova become more and more dominant, producing more iron and lowering down the ratio. On the other hand, there's also the explosive alpha elements like calcium, silicon, titanium. And they are not super pure alpha because they are contaminated by other sources that's not type 2 supernovae. So here we see the trend is actually relatively flat in the recent galaxy. And this tells us that, you know, the um, nucleosynthetic path is not super alpha-like. Um, so the alpha elements are just sort of an example of how we can tell different stories about how galaxies involved uh, just looking at these trends. Um, actually, the alpha sequence is an important marker of these two distinct populations. So here in the low alpha population, uh, these stars are generally more metal rich, they're younger, and then they're sort of located in a galactic plane. On the other hand, the high alpha population, they're usually metal poor, uh, they're older, and they're sort of located above and below the galactic plane. And this is sort of what they look like in a galaxy. Uh, this is work that's been done by Govind. And here is just the distribution of these two sequences. So here we're moving out from the inner galaxy to the outer galaxy. And here we're moving uh, above and below the plane this way. So what he's trying to do is he's trying to scale uh, apogee parameters with scalar using machine learning. And like Sven said, we can like put all of these um, different samples onto a very common scale and we can have even a bigger sample to look at these chemical evolutions. And um, here we can see that these um, two populations are nicely separated. And this is sort of an important constraint into validating a lot of these uh, chemodynamical models, which I'll briefly touch on in the end. So just qualitatively, um, if we look at sort of the solar neighborhood here, and as we move away from the plane, we see this alpha sequence actually kind of becomes less and less dominant, whereas we start really to see the emergence of these high, um, high alpha population. On the other hand, if we sort of move out from the middle of the Milky Way to the outer edges, we see that this low alpha population has gets less and less metal rich. And this is sort of an indication of how the Milky Way has sort of formed um, inside out. Now, usually these alpha sequences are um, defined in chemistry, but we are sort of slowly so seeing this, um, the manifestation of them in kind of the age distribution themselves, uh, because we have such a large galactic sample. So here is the age distribution function. And here I've corrected for the glass selection bias. And then we kind of see some kind of structure in this distribution. And one other thing that I speculate is that the secondary peak here could be a manifestation of the high alpha sequence. Now, if you look at the chemistry of this high peak here, we see that it is actually significantly more enriched than magnesium, which is an alpha element. So it does leave the credence that this is something going on there. Now, if this is real, then it has some implications into um, the star formation history. Uh, for instance, it could be a quenching of star formation between the high and low alphas. And this is sort of um, observed in smaller samples, but this scalar sample is the biggest one that we've seen yet. Um, but even I have to admit that, you know, this uh, evidence is not super conclusive. So I was really hoping for the DR3, um, which that we're able to have three times more the sample size and more accurate abundances and ages. So I can really see if this secondary peak is real or not. And I really hope it's real because that's like entirely of my PhD. <clears throat> and finally, I'll just talk a little bit about the modeling. And this is work is being done by Sanjeev Sharma. Um, so this is an example of an analytical chemodynamical model, which combines both chemical evolution and kinematics. Uh, so basically, these stars are sort of allowed to form in different galactic radii, so allowed to sort of co-mingle and start enriching the ISM. And from this, they are sort of able to uh, predict age, velocity, position, and abundances. And here are just example of um, the prediction uh, in light of the apogee survey. So here, they are able to predict really accurately sort of what the, thin, uh, the high and low alpha sequence will look like in a galaxy, and that looks really similar to the plot um, Govind is showing. Um, and hopefully, we're able to use this kind of work on Gala as well. Um, so in conclusion, uh, this is sort of my very brief overview on the um, chemistry and ages in Gala. 
And uh, we're really all looking forward to DR3. Thank you. Thank you.